The news industry is in trouble. No headline there, though the statistics are still startling. The journalism industry is losing jobs at a far faster pace than the rest of the economy. Scores of newspapers have shut down their print editions or closed shop altogether over the past two years. It has gotten so bad that the Federal Trade Commission is stepping in with recommendations on how to save the industry. Among the FTC's suggestions, granting news organizations tax exemptions, perhaps expanding copyright restrictions, even government subsidies. These ideas leave many First Amendment activists uneasy here. But interestingly, Columbia University President Lee Bollinger says they may actually have to be options we consider right now. Mr. Bollinger joins me now from Columbia University. Good morning to you, uh, sir. I've, I've got to say, you are such a well-known uh, First Amendment defender here. You shocked a lot of people by coming out and saying uh, that this government should be putting money in, into uh, the media. I mean, how is it that you, you changed your position in some ways here? Well, I haven't changed my position. I, I think the first thing to realize is that we've had a system over the past century that included significant public regulation and public subsidies to our press, uh, not least of which is the PBS system and NPR, but also the broadcasting uh, field was a mixture of a hybrid, really, of private and public regulation. So what we have today, which I think is probably the greatest press in the world, is the product not simply of a free market, but of a, a mixed system. And my idea, my thought, uh, is that we really need to now think about a global free press. Mm -hmm. Many countries, CCTV from China, Al Jazeera from Qatar, and so on, are moving into this space of trying to influence and, and report on the world. And we really need to be part of that. And building on our NPR and PBS is, I think, a, a very sensible way to go. Well, it is a, a key American principle here, you know, that, that a free and open press, press is part and parcel of a functioning democracy. When you talk about Xinhua or Al Jazeera or some of these other uh, foreign news agencies, they're going into this business theoretically with the point of view added in. Yes, uh, yes, they are. And of course, BBC is another government funded um, a part of the world press and uh, highly respected. So uh, and and so is some of the um, other government funded uh, press uh, institutions, France 24 and and uh, others. I think the key point uh, is really to uh, recognize that getting information, journalistic, professional, uh, independent uh, mm -hmm. information to the world and to us is a critical part of building both the United States and our role in the world and a, and a better world. How we do that and how we accomplish it is, I, I think, the key question. And I think there is some should be some role for public funding building on what we already have. Well, it, when you pen this editorial, uh, you not only caused shocked waves, you caused others to come out and write on this topic as well. And well-known author and blogger Jeff Jarvis came out and, and made the point that journalism's entrepreneurial, not institutional. You'll inhibit it if you get the government involved and pointed to new media as actually lowering the barrier for entry. If you can type, if you got a computer, you can get your information out there. Why doesn't that work? Right, and I think that's uh, very important. I think the expansion of the new technologies of communication and opportunities for people to speak and report on the world is a, is a great thing. So from the standpoint of the First Amendment, from the standpoint of public policy and our values, uh, we really want to encourage that. I think there's no evidence in history and there's no uh, reason to think in theory that we will get all the kind of reporting on the world we need mm -hmm. simply by relying on the on uh, the free market. Uh, that has not been the case and I think it's unlikely to be the case. So I think we really need to consider building, as I said, on what we already have, which has significant yeah. public funding in it. Next year, he'll take over as chair of the New York Federal Reserve Bank of the 12 regional bank chairman. He's the only one who is not actively involved in the business sector. He's community leader, really, here, uh, and very much an intellectual. We want to turn back to you, uh, Mr. Bollinger, now. I want to ask you, because we've been talking about your point of view uh, on the media and that space. As such an outspoken First Amendment uh, defender here, 
you're in an interesting position now at the Fed, given that you're, you're, you're going to be working in an institution that has been very close to the press, very little information actually shared. How are you going to uh, look at the issue of transparency there? Well, I think uh, this is a major issue, obviously, for the society. Uh, the Federal Reserve System has been uh, a really important part of the structure of government uh, in the United States with a good deal of independence, uh, really designed to, to try to provide guidance to the American economy and the world economy uh, and be free of some of the political influences, much like the judiciary. I think the, the question uh, of transparency is one that is deeply uh, uh, important and one that the Fed Reserve System is, is really trying to, uh, to grapple with. I know that Ben Bernanke, mm -hmm. when, he be, when he started, wanted to become more transparent, and that's certainly been true of Bill Dudley at the uh, New York Federal Reserve. So I, I think this is an ongoing one with greater transparency probably in the future. Uh, well, certainly it's changed on the monetary policy front. When it comes to uh, some of the supervisory roles uh, of particularly the New York Fed, mm -hmm. what should be disclosed there? I mean, what about levels of risk or things that are being monitored by the Fed? Well, I think that this is really something for the system and the Board of Governors uh, in Washington, D.C. to work out. So it's not, uh, not really uh, my primary responsibility. As I said, I think there's a movement towards greater transparency, but like any part of the government or any part of um, any organization, uh, you can't have complete transparency and mm -hmm. function effectively. So where that balance should be, I, I think, is, is a big issue for the next several years. So uh, when it comes to, excuse me, communicating with the public at large, uh, the question about Dodd-Frank bill, financial reform, front and center, New York Fed, part of, of some of those changes. I mean, what has actually changed in how the Fed is going to carry out business? How is your role going to change? Well, I mean, that's a very broad question, and I think, um, I think already uh, there have been significant uh, changes. Um, I, I think everybody uh, in the system, in the institution, realizes uh, that there were uh, breakdowns and, and um, uh, missed opportunities. Uh, ben Bernanke has uh, said, and Bill Dudley uh, has also said, that there was a, a failure to make connections, a failure of knowledge. Uh, I think all of these things are uh, changing the way in which bank supervision works and, and uh, the kinds of uh, scrutiny that uh, institutions subject to regulation will receive. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, as you know, there will be a major uh, sort of study of the entire system conducted by the GAO over the right. next year or so. Uh, and that will, I think, be very uh, important. When conversations with the New York Fed come up, the question of the controversy around uh, Stephen Friedman and his experience, former Goldman Sachs executive who had served in the role you're taking on, comes to mind. How is the, the disclosure or uh, the amount of, of um, scrutiny that you have to undergo to take this job changed in the wake of that? Well, I think Steve Friedman performed a really admirable role. Remember, this is, uh, this is public service that, right. uh, that we're doing and um, trying the best to, to serve. I think uh, Steve uh, uh, acted at a time of great uh, crisis according to uh, as the general counsel of the New York Fed said, completely consistent uh, mm -hmm. with uh, uh, with his obligations. Uh, but um, uh, I think all of us uh, appreciate the importance of trying to avoid uh, conflict of interest or the appearance. And uh, you know, this is um, this is very important for the public that uh, they have confidence in the Federal Reserve System. You're a prominent advocate of, of affirmative action. The question of diversity. Are you satisfied with the makeup of, of the Fed board? Well, I think there's always room for improvement on diversity. I think this is a national commitment we made 50 years ago, beginning with Brown versus Board of Education. And, okay. and I think great progress has been made, but there's always room for more. Well, thank you. Good luck with thank the new you. job. Thank you for your time. Sure.